Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning everybody, this is uh, Professor Y. K. Gupta, former head of department from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. I will be talking today on drugs use for peptic ulcer. Now, you may be knowing that several diseases are known as lifestyle diseases like diabetes, hypertension, psychiatric illnesses and one of that is also peptic ulcer. So, if I say the common causes of peptic ulcer, what could be the common causes of peptic ulcer is one if a person is constantly under stress there is a release of uh, hydrochloric acid in the stomach. If a person is suffering from continuous pain, maybe arthritis or other things, he takes long duration high doses of uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs like aspirin, ibuprofen, ketoprofen, and things like that. Or the person has an infection which in India we have several sources of a fecal oral infection of H. pylori. So, if you just think that this all factors multiple factors can lead to ulceration in the stomach and duodenum and that is what we call as peptic ulcer. Now, if I just say that what would be today we will be talking on drugs used in peptic ulcer disease and uh, I have to take next. We would be talking on the drugs used in peptic ulcer disease. So, what is basically the pathophysiology? What happens in peptic ulcer is there is a disruption of a mucous membrane. This is the stomach, and in the stomach, there is a mucous membrane, and this mucous membrane gets disrupted this is the stomach and if you just see the mucous membrane here, this is the mucous membrane which gets disrupted here and, and this disruption of the mucous membrane causes ulceration and this ulceration is the disruption of the mucous membrane and ultimately sometimes this can be deeper and this can also lead to perforation of ulcer. Now, this mucous membrane here has two things one this is a constant release of hydrochloric acid in the fundus area from the parietal cells and this acid which is released in the stomach is essential for the digestion of food. However, this also is a damaging the mucous membrane. Now, for that purpose there is a protective covering of prostaglandin here which covers the delicate mucous membrane from the action of hydrochloric acid. Now, if you see that the 
what happens in peptic ulcer disease there is an imbalance between the the excessive production of acid on one hand and there is a decrease in mucosal defense. So, this is the balance between the two that is acid production and a pepsin production which goes high and the, the mucosal production and the production of prostaglandin which is a defense mechanism goes low. So, this imbalance leads to the attack on the mucous membrane and thereby there can be formulation of ulcer. You see here that this is the parietal cell and this parietal cell leads to the release of uh, acid in oxentic cell. Now, what could be the major stimuli for excessive hydrochloric acid secretion in the stomach? If I am too much stressed, the acid secretion is increased. If I am taking too much spicy food, the hydrochloric acid secretion increases. If I take too much of coffee, caffeine and these things, the hydrochloric acid increases. And the hydrochloric acid increase is usually more in the night, which is called as a nighttime outburst. If I am taking long duration anti inflammatory drugs, the hydrochloric acid increases. And that is, but how this all happens? This all happens primarily through the three mechanism in, in, the, in, in, the, in the gut. In the gut, there is uh, one is what is called as a hist histamine receptor, which is called as a muscarinic receptors, the cholinergic receptor, sorry, which is primarily M1, M2, and M3 receptors. All the receptors are involved, but it is primarily M3 type of receptors which are involved in release of of hydrochloric acid. Now, the other is the histamine and histamine has two type of receptors primarily H 1 receptor and H 2 receptors. And if you remember the H 1 receptors are primarily involved in capillary permeability and allergic reaction. Therefore, H 1 receptor antagonists are used for for as an anti allergic. Whereas, for the first time Black et al showed that the H 2 receptors are present in the stomach and they cause release of hydrochloric acid. And this was a such an important discovery that they got the Nobel prize for discovering the H 2 receptors. Because if you block the H 2 receptors in the stomach, if you block the histamine H 2 receptors then you get suppression. That led to the discovery of several H 2 receptor antagonists, which are still most popular for acidity or acid pepsic disorder or disease peptic ulcer. The third stimuli is gastrin and this gastrin causes release of cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin also causes release of histamine H 2 stimulation and muscarinic receptor stimulation and thereby is also important factor. If you just see this diagram, you will see that, that this is the regulation of acid secretion and you see that the gastrin is released which will act on enterochromaffin cell and will act on the muscarinic M 1 receptor of which is of acetylcholine. And then acetylcholine will also act now on the muscarinic M 3 receptor and the another gastroenterochromaffin cell will stimulate histaminergic 
receptor that is H 2 receptor. So, histamine H 2 receptors also get stimulated the C C K 2 receptor also get stimulated and as a difference also the prostaglandin also get stimulated. Now, you see the balance there are three things M 3 receptors, histamine H 2 receptors, cholecystokinin receptors they all are stimulating ultimately the hydrogen potassium ATPase and this hydrogen potassium pump which is also called as a proton pump this causes release of H ions in the lumen of the fundus and this H ion is responsible primarily for acidity. On the other hand a balancing mechanism is the prostaglandin which provides a protective coverage to the mucous membrane. Now, when this protective coverage is lost or reduced particularly with the prostaglandin synthesis inhibitor NSAIDs or non steroidal anti inflammatory agents these things like M 3 H 2 and these can stimulate. Now, just remember that in major thing if I put this arrow bigger that means, the H 2 receptor stimulation is larger and more as compared to M 3 receptor and therefore, the treatment strategy now if you just recap this pathology the treatment strategy of peptic ulcer could be you give first you give histamine H 2 receptor blocker. The second you give M 3 anticholinergic receptor blocker, third you give proton pump inhibitor, fourth you give the neutralizing agent for the acid which is already in the GIT. Now, rush and fourth you increase the production of prostaglandin. So, if I ask you to enumerate the strategy from peptic ulcer what would be number one the cause that means you reduce the stress number two you do take the food intake change the lifestyle. So, that the acid production is less and then is the drug treatment and in the drug treatment the first would be you start from the beginning you release you stop the source that means give histamine H 2 receptor blocker B you can combine it with anticholinergics because anticholinergics are weaker in this action has a larger side effect. So, anticholinergics are not used as a standalone. Third you give the proton pump inhibitors and fourthly you give antacids which will neutralize the released acid and fifth you give prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are primarily reserved because of the side effect and because of the cost for only those cases where there is a prostaglandin inhibition is a major cause that is in non steroidal induced anti inflammatory uh, uh, drugs induced peptic ulcer. Now, if you just see this diagram the ultimate approach is is the hydrogen potassium pump which is called as a proton pump. So, naturally if you give proton pump inhibitor the effectiveness or efficacy would be maximum as compared to give you give H 2 blocker and therefore, proton pump inhibitor are the strongest longest acting and today most popularly used drug for peptic ulcer disease. Now, this is just what I said agents that suppress acid secretion 
what are the agents just recap one is the proton pump inhibitor or you can call as a hydrogen potassium pump inhibitor second is histamine H2 receptor blocker and third is a cholinergic M1 receptor blocker agent that will neutralize acid once it is released is antacids an immediate reduction in the neutralization can happen by antacids. So, if I want to have a quick action then I will take the acid neutralizing agent that is antacids. Now, agent which will enhance the mucosal defense is the prostaglandin drugs and this is the mesoprostol or you protect the ulcer which has already formed by a soothing agent and that is called as a ulcer protective agent which is sucralfate or carbinoloxone. This pro, the, if this is ulcer sucralfate will just coat this ulcer and carbinoloxone will coat this ulcer therefore, this will protect the ulcer from further damage of hydrochloric acid and will be helpful in its healing. This ulcer particularly in India or poor hygienic places it has been found that in a bacteria which is called as a helicobacteria pylori H pylori this is also involved in causation of ulcer. In a large number of population about 70 percent plus H pylori has been found to be present and it was found that if you eradicate if you cure H pylori infection the peptic ulcer disease can also be cured. But this is a challenge because H pylori is coming from the food contamination and once you eradicate then you have to live in a healthy situation and therefore, relapse is a problem with H pylori infection also. Now, for H pylori it has been found that the five drugs are effective primarily amoxicillin, clarithromycin, bismuth, metronidazole and tetracycline and what was found that if you give a combination of these drugs then H pylori eradication is faster and more and the important thing is relapse is less. So, if we say the role of H pylori infection is has to be very tricky because the relapse occurs and is a combination of drug and the drug which have been found to be best are amoxicillin, cloxacillin sometimes, clarithromycin, bismuth, metronidazole and tetracycline. This is uh, if you just see coming back to how the drugs can act then if you just see that this is the cholinergic muscarinic receptors, histamine H2 receptors, cholecystokinin receptors and prostaglandin. So, the proton pump inhibitors is the major source because ultimately what you have done you have blocked the last place and you can give the muscarinic receptor antagonist you can give H2 receptor antagonist. So, this is and you give prostaglandin synthesis analog if you understand this you have understood the modality of the treatment of peptic ulcer. Now, we talk on the peptic or the proton pump inhibitors. This is if you just see the diagram because this is the ultimate pump which causes a release of uh, acid. So, this is the most potent suppressor of gastric acid secretion and the secretion suppression is 80 to 95 percent and this is inhibitor is a gastric 
proton pump inhibitor. So, proton pump inhibitors the three cardinal features that this is the most strong proton pump inhibitors blocks acid secretion up to 95 percent almost negligible is present and this is the most potent. Automatically you will say if the hydrochloric acid is completely finished in the stomach whether this is good or bad and that is the side effect of proton pump inhibitor. Complete, complete a chlorhydria for long time can have an effect on absorption of certain drugs of certain food supplements certain food items and can have some side effects also. Now, this is the proton pump inhibitors pentaprazole is one of the most commonly used umiprazole, isomeprazole, lenzoprazole, dexlenzoprazole, rebiprazole. Now, all these prazoles are proton pump inhibitors are not much significant different in their therapeutic efficacy, but these are all available and with minor differences and most important thing which you must remember that they are almost equal comparative efficacy except that some have a longer duration of action, some claim to have a better efficacy because they are a new salt like isomeprazole is S isomer of omeprazole and supposed to have slightly better efficacy. Lenzaprazole and this is also an R, R isomer of lenzoprazole, dexlenzoprazole, ribiprazole. So, these are the available proton pump inhibitor. So, when you prescribe, I would recommend that you assess the cost versus the benefit and prescribe the drug which is the most fit drug into this. This is primarily a pentaprazole or, or omeprazole they are a pro drug and they are converted into active drug and this causes almost irreversible inhibition of the proton pump. This is the proton pump. So, this blocks the proton pump and this is almost irreversible that means unless new proton pump are generated this proton pump will not be able to release hydrochloric acid that is why the duration of action is almost 28 to 48 hours. The plasma half life that means is a shorter 0 0.5 to 3 hours, but this is an example where you can say that the blood level may fall, but the effect continues for long and in 2 to 5 days therapy almost 70 percent of the proton pump is inhibited. The acidic pH of the parietal cell is required for drug activation and that is why what you said that it should highly be given at least 30 minutes before meals. This is important because most of the drugs we say that to have reduction in the side effect you give with food, but this is the case when you must remember the proton pump inhibitors are best taken if a 30 minutes prior to food is considered. Rapidly absorbed and reach a small bowel and then it is a highly protein bound drug. When you say highly protein bound drug that means it stays in the blood for longer duration and this is metabolized by cytochrome P450. This is important because if you are giving concurrently other drugs which are also metabolized by cytochrome P450, there is a possibility of drug interaction. Now, if you just see that from where it is mostly absorbed is, is intestine or beyond the duodenum and that is why the drugs are available as mostly the enteric coated tablet or within the gelatin capsule when you purchase a pentaprazole 
you see that it has a capsule and within the capsule there is a the enteric coated pellets and that will be released in the small intestine. So, this is delayed, de, uh, delayed release tablets and capsule, there is a delayed release oral suspension, there is the enteric coated microgranules, there is the enteric coated tablets, there is a powder omeprazole combined with sodium bicarbonate. So, that it goes into the intestine and gets released. Where are they used primarily? I would not recommend an omeprazole or pentaprazole for just a symptomatic relief of hyperacidity. If you have taken too much of oily food, take it. But the primary indication is the gastric and duodenal ulcer. If this is the gastric ulcer, the gastric ulcer or the duodenum ulcer, this is the two major indication of, of, of uh, proton pump inhibitors. You might have seen some patients who have a gastroesophageal reflux disorder and this reflux means the acid comes out of this the esophagus from the esophagus sometimes in the mouth also that is called as a GERD and this causes erosion of the of the of the esophageal mucosa also and in this there can be erosive esophagitis in this case these drugs are given. Also given in the non steroidal associated gastritis which is very common is as common as road accidents. Zollinger Ellison syndrome where there is a continuous very high release of, uh, of hydrochloric acid and this is also given when there is established H pylori infection because you treat the bacteria, but you also block the hydrochloric acid secretion because that is causing the major symptoms. As I said the common side effects are nausea, abdominal pain, constipation, flatulence and would be those which are associated with complete achlorhydria. That is it can reduce the bioavailability of the drugs such as ketoconazole, ampicillin and iron salts. So, if the person is anemic giving iron salt and also you are giving pentaprazole or omeprazole or other drugs then you must remember that this will reduce the absorption and this will also cause vitamin B12 deficiency and sometimes the myopathy and skin rashes can also occur. But otherwise this is considered to be reasonably safe. The important thing which we must remember in today's scenario that the evidence are coming that uh, prolonged use of uh, H2 blockers, prolonged use of uh, proton pump inhibitors has increased the incidence of bone fracture. But this incidence bone fracture is not that high is, is but it is a recent finding and therefore, this must also be kept in mind particularly in elderly patients. And this increases susceptibility to certain infection particularly hospital acquired infection pneumonia and this has also been with an hypergastrinemia because the acid is completely suppressed and this can cause. As I said this has a drug interaction primarily because of uh, the absorption of certain drugs can be altered because of omeprazole inhibits cytochrome P450 and therefore, this can decreasing the clearance of phenytoin and you may find suddenly if the patient is epileptic phenytoin level may go up and may cause side effects and can inhibit the conversion of clopidogrels into active form. And if the patient is getting clopidogrel and is stabilized 
and then you may find that this may become ineffective certain times. So, these are the important few drug interaction which we must remember that is about the proton pump inhibitors. The another group is H2 receptor antagonists and these H2 receptor antagonists if you just recap will mechanism of action it will block the histamine H2 receptors from the parietal cells and the classical drugs which are used again is a cimetidine which was a major discovery for which the Nobel prize was given, but now cimetidine is not used. So, do not remember do not narrate though I have mentioned it here cimetidine because it has an anti androgenic side effect it has a lot of drug interaction, but this has a historical importance and the message here is these all are other H 2 receptor antagonists ranitidine most commonly used, fimotidine is commonly used, nizatidine are commonly used, but that indicates that all these drugs may also have some degree or less degree or negligible anti androgenic side effect also. They are less potent than proton pump inhibitor because if this is a histamine, histamine H2 receptor ultimate it is going to proton pump inhibitor means hydrogen potassium pump and we are blocking it here whereas this is has the other effect from muscarinic receptor. So, blocking at the histamine receptor blocks about 70 percent of histamine release in 24 hours and this inhibits the basal secretion. The hydrochloric acid is always there in the stomach which is called as a basal secretion, but the hydrochloric acid releases higher in certain time that is called as a stimulated secretion. For example, non steroidal anti inflammatory drug the fatty diet or the stress or pentagastrin when you stimulate these things that is called a stimulated. So, this inhibits the effectively the basal secretion that is why they are effective. Absorbed very fast and reasonably good and the bioavailability is good and the half life is just 1 to 3 and a half hours is less protein bound that means that you have to take it more than once a day then recommended dose is twice a day and excretion is by kidney dose adjustment of this is usually required when the kidney function is very poor otherwise dose adjustment is not recommend is not required. Interestingly and importantly the H 2 blockers are also available as oral tablet and also available as intravenous because many times patient of stress or injury are burned they are under tremendous stress situation and in those patients the intravenous H 2 blocker or intravenous serenitidine or intravenous uh, other H 2 blockers are given. So, what would be the therapeutic uses of? Therapeutic uses naturally will be the gastric ulcer, therapeutic use can be the duodenal ulcer, uncomplicated GERD gastroesophageal reflex disorder and stress ulcers. Many time people take before going to interviews before going to exam in exam session people take this, but this is not a good use. People go to parties and they know that they will take alcohol and then they will take spicy food so they take prophylactic H 2 blocker, but that is not a good use. Instead of that I think we should avoid such stimulus which are requiring medication. Adverse effects some people suffer from diarrhea headache, drowsiness, fatigue, muscle pain, some people have constipation and rare is thrombocytopenia, but these side effects are not so common and recently as I said there is evidence which is coming up that the chronic use of H 2 blockers 
may increase the possibility of fracture, but again is a different. Now, the third approach is one you have talked about peptic ulcer by proton pump inhibitor, second is by H2 blocker, and third is once the acid is released, you give antacids here. Now, if you want to give the antacids, you have to give the to neutralize acid, you have to give the basic drug. That means you have hydrochloric acid. So, most powerful would be the sodium bicarbonate. Now, if you give sodium bicarbonate, that means this is the most powerful, but we at the same time do not want this alkali to go inside the body. So, there could be two type of antacids. One is which goes inside the body that means a systemic antacid. The other is which remains in the stomach which is called as a non-systemic antacids. Now, this is if you just see these are the basic drug which neutralizes acid. It will immediately neutralize acid and provide symptomatic relief rather than treating the disease. It immediately if I have a severe acidity the immediate release which I will get is by the antacid preparation. It has a local action and very less systemic absorption. That is the most important thing. If it goes inside the body, inside the stomach, after inside the stomach it goes into the circulation, it may cause alkalosis which is not the purpose. And just remember two things. One is uh, the other agents is the magnesium salts and the other salts are the calcium salt. Now, magnesium hydroxide and magnesium aluminum hydroxide, magnesium and aluminum hydroxide, these are the weak alkaline substances. Now, magnesium and uh, aluminum, if they are given, they cause laxative effect. They can cause diarrhea, intend to cause diarrhea. Whereas, the calcium salt, which you give as a calcium hydroxide or other things, then the calcium salt, this can cause constipation. Therefore, usually, what you do is you combine the magnesium salt with calcium salt and aluminum salts and therefore, they are given in combination that is magnesium hydroxide and aluminum hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide and aluminum hydroxide plus magnesium trisilicate. Magnesium trisilicate has a longer duration of action and aluminum hydroxide has semithicone because semithicone is also is a is a gas neutralizing or adsorbent capacity. Now, sodium bicarbonate is called as a systematic because systemic because systemic it goes into this and therefore, it is not preferred particularly it uh, can produce carbon dioxide and uh, because acid is immediately released carbon dioxide is produced because acid and base interaction. So, person will feel the distension and belching and sometimes distension which has been the major adverse effect. And there are one or two incidences which are rare that if there is an ulcer and then there is a sudden release of carbon dioxide here and which gives a pressure then this can be also rupture of peptic ulcer. This has happened, but these are rarest of rare incidents. Now, some examples of antacids, magnesium hydroxide and aluminum hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, aluminum hydroxide and magnesium trisinicone. So, these and the calcium causes. Now, the calcium is uh, salts are important. They are stronger than the magnesium, but the problem with calcium salt is that they cause the reduction in the acid, but once you withdraw then there is a rebound 
and so is the case with sodium bicarbonate. This will cause sudden reduction, but once you withdraw it, this will cause the rebound hyper uh, uh, hyper acidity, and therefore a continuous to continue to have acid neutralization you give this in combination. Magnesium is a fast acting and, uh, and the aluminum is slow acting. So, what you do you combine with magnesium fast acting combine with aluminum salt that means it takes care of the release of hydrochloric acid for some more time. And in this as I said one will cause constipation other will tend to cause diarrhea therefore, you combine two so that the adverse effect of those can be neutralized. Now, this is uh, after this chapter you have neutralized the third the next would be the ulcer which has been formed this is the ulcer which has been formed you protect this ulcer that is sucralfate so coating the coating of this ulcer and that is the sucralfate is is a demulsion type of thing it coats the this and then also you do the prostaglandin analog which also forms the protective covering so protection is required where there is a continuous insult and that is primarily for non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs and this is mesoprostol is a prostaglandin analog and the dose is 10 to 100 to 200 microgram and this is contraindicated in pregnancy because this can cause uterine contraction if you just remember the prostaglandin are primarily used as a uterine or stimulant prostaglandins are used also to induce abortion. So, prostaglandin can cause the contraction in the in the uterine. So, this must be contra it is contraindicated in pregnancy. Now, sucralfate is a combination of, uh, of sucrose and aluminum hydroxide at pH less than 4 undergoes extensive cross linkage to produce viscous. So, now here you see the low pH is important for action of sucralfate. So, sucralfate therefore, should be given on empty stomach and it usually is not combined with antacids and this is antacids avoided within 30 minutes of sucralfate administration. Remember one thing sucralfate is not combined with antacid because and some degree of acidity is important to have action of sucralfate. M1 receptor as I said the muscarinic receptors also involved and muscarinic receptors that means the cholinergic and cholinergic is supplied by vagus nerve. So, historically before these drugs were available the treatment of peptic ulcer was to cut the vagus nerve vagotomy and but that is not yet done what you are doing here is you are doing chemical vagotomy by giving muscarinic m1 receptor by certain anti cholinergic drug which act preferentially on git that is pirenzepine and telenzepine mind you that cholinergic system is primarily not involved and therefore, is not the primary treatment, but usually is given in combination in refractory cases with H 2 blocker or with proton pump inhibitors. It suppresses neural stimulation of gastric action rarely used drug because of the poor efficacy and because of the anti cholinergic side effects. And if you remember what are the effects of atropine that all will be the side effect of phenazepine dryness of mouth constipation retention of urine loss of accommodation this can be the side effects of this 
other drugs are also used, but I would not suggest you to remember them so efficiently. That is ribamipide increases prostaglandin generation. So, this is primarily reserved for non steroidal anti inflammatory drug induced and ecabet increases from prostaglandin, but these are quite expensive and bismuth compound for the treatment of H pylori. So, now to summarize the peptic ulcer disease, the primary objective is to reduce the hydrochloric acid by the H 2 blockers, proton pump inhibitors protecting mucosa by sucralfate, prostaglandin, neutralize hydrochloric acid by antacids, primarily by combination because systemic is sodium bicarbonate can go into the body and cause systemic alkalosis. If you give only calcium, it can cause constipation, it can cause hypercalcemia if you get only magnesium, it can cause diarrhea. Therefore, all antacids are given as a combination, but antacids will give immediate relief and long term relief can be achieved with H 2 blocker. Prolonged duration can be seen with proton pump inhibitors. So, I end here and I am sure that after this talk, you will be able to understand the mechanism of peptic ulcer and the drugs how they can be used to reduce the symptoms as well as to improve the healing of the peptic ulcer. Thank you very much.